public interest birds of a feather session with the SPI board uh, or a subset of the SPI board. Um, we have uh, Bedell Garby, who's the president. We have Michael Schulteis, who's the treasurer. Jonathan McDowell, who is the secretary. And Jimmy Kaplowitz, who is the director. Um, so everybody, uh, welcome to the board here. And uh, I'm not sure, Michael, are you starting off? Uh, thanks for coming to the SPI BOF. Uh, our brief agenda is an uh, introduction of the board members and officers we have here, which has already occurred. Then we have a brief overview and history of SPI, a uh, slide showing our associated projects, a slide about our financial s status, and then a question and answer section. Uh, at DEPCOMP 10, we have half of the board of directors of SPI present. Uh, Bedale, uh, Jonathan McDowell, myself, and Jimmy Kaplowitz. Uh, Joshua Drake, who is involved in the Postgres project, was originally scheduled to attend DEPCOMP 10, but due to uh, scheduling difficulties, he was unable to make it. Uh, we also uh, recently had board elections. Uh, for the past several years, we have had a nine-member board of directors, but we had five open seats this time and four people running for those seats, so we shrank down to our uh, minimum size of eight people on the board of directors. Uh, SBI is Software in the Public Interest. It's a nonprofit organization which was founded to help organizations uh, develop and distribute open hardware and software. Uh, it's an organization that holds Debian funds in the United States. It also has assets such as the Debian trademark, uh, several domain names for Debian uh, projects as well as the copyright to the Debian logo. Yeah, I was just going to amplify slightly. One of the things that's interesting about having DebConf not only in the United States but in, in New York is that uh, we're actually incorporated in the state of New York as a New York corporation. So uh, even though I guess Jimmy's the only person who's on the board who's currently a resident of this fine state, um, for legal reasons this is where the, the corporate headquarters are. So uh, just an interesting little factoid there. Uh, this is a brief history of SBI. Uh, as Bedell mentioned, we were incorporated in the state of New York. Uh, that happened on June 16th in 1997. In 1999, the United States Internal Revenue Service uh, granted SPI uh, 501c3 tax-exempt status. Uh, that means contributions from donors within the United States may be tax-deductible. Uh, SPI was originally started to serve the needs of Debian, but it has grown to serve many other additional free software projects. Uh, this slide lists the associated projects of SBI. Uh, we have OS Unix, which is an open source version of Solaris. Uh, there's Path64, which is a, a high performance compiler. Citix is a Debian based distribution, which is based on the SID uh, or unstable version of Debian. Uh, of course, there's Debian itself. Uh, the OFTC IRC network, openoffice.org, freedesktop.org, Privoxy, Mad Wi-Fi, uh, Fresco, Postgres, Yafaray, OpenVaz, Tux for Kids, Gallery, uh, the Helios Project, Open Voting Foundation, OpenWRT, and Drupal. And I apologize if I missed anything. Oh, GNU Tuxmax. Uh, that was joined SBI several years ago and hasn't been very actively involved in SBI, but they still do have a uh, non-zero financial balance with SBI, so I assume they're still uh, somewhat associated. Uh, this is the financial status of SBI as of June 30th. Uh, as you can see, Debian has a fairly significant balance. Uh, most of those, or a good portion of those Debian funds will be spent uh, paying for the DEFCONF 10 conference. But uh, there are several other projects that have uh, non-zero balances. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me about that since I'm the SPI treasurer. Uh, SPI membership is open to anyone who is interested in uh, applying for membership. There are two different types of SPI memberships. Uh, there's what's called non-contributing, which doesn't give you voting rights in SPI. Then there are contributing. Membership, uh, you can find out more about the membership at the uh, URL at the bottom of this slide. Uh, 
as of yesterday, there were 847 current members, including 405 non-contributing and 442 contributing members. And all of our SBI board, mem our board meetings are held in the SBI channel on OFTC. Uh, we also have several mailing lists. Uh, you can go to lists.spi-inc.org to find out more about our mailing lists. Uh, you can also talk to half of the board here at DEPCONF10. And that's all we have in our slide deck, so we'll open it up to questions. Any questions? All right. Well, I have a question for the people who aren't asking questions. Since you don't have questions, why are you here? What, what made you interested in coming to this talk? What, why, why, what's your interest in SPI? I'll answer, but it's, it's really not a bad, it's not a good answer. 414 was way overcrowded. <laughs> so actually, I mean, I, I'll, I'll comment. It's, it's, it's very interesting because a number of years ago, um, we had some you know, serious process problems in SPI. Um, the, there's the sort of infamous issue of a, a box of materials that were in the hands of our then treasurer going missing and a lot of checks not getting deposited and you know, having to go back to donors and apologize either for losing their checks or whatever. And, and one of the things that I think is, is, is something I think that all of us on the board are particularly proud of is that you know, it's been years now since we've had any of that kind of you know, unpleasantness going on. Things, for the most part, are just working pretty well. And, you know, we've been gradually accreting more projects. But if you think about it, um, back in 97, what, what was the, I forget, it was 97 when we were first incorporated. The, the, the whole motivation was that there needed to be some legal entity in the U.S. to hold various assets on behalf of the Debian project. One of the wonderful things about Debian, after all, is that it's a, um, an organization of volunteers who've made common cause, but there's no you know, particular company behind it. It's one of the things that really substantially differentiates us from many other Linux distribution activities. And at the same time, you know, in, in order to be able to accept donations of hardware from certain companies who wanted the tax benefits of making a donation, in order to be able to accept financial donations from individuals and have them able to, to get the tax benefits that you can have of you know, um, donating to a recognized nonprofit corporation in the U.S. And, and things like this, and hold domain names and trademark paperwork and all these sorts of things, we needed to have a legal entity somewhere. Um, and thanks to the folks who were you know, motivated to do the work, we got one in the U.S. It's actually kind of cool now. If you <coughs> pay attention to such things, there are a number of organizations in other parts of the world. Um, you know, we've got FFIS, I guess, in Germany. There's the Association Software Libre in Brazil and various other organizations around the world that are holding assets on behalf of the Debian project. And so SPI is now just one of a set of organizations holding legal assets and, and financial contributions in different parts of the world when you look at this from a Debian perspective. But simultaneously, SPI has gone broad. The original charter was written um, sort of expansively with this notion that if we're going to go to the trouble of incorporating and getting 501c3 tax exemption status, which is non-trivial, I mean, no matter how good your lawyers are, it takes a year or so to get through all that paperwork. Um, you know, if we were going to do that, we might as well take a more expansive view of the world. And as you can see from our um, associated projects list, uh, there are a lot of interesting projects now that are taking advantage of our services. Uh, some of them are a little higher overhead to deal with than others, but um, all in all, I'm just tickled that you know this mechanism we built um, has you know been able to survive that test of time and that we've seen both this expansion of other organizations holding assets in other countries for Debian, so we aren't always getting nailed with international funds transfer and asset transfer legal constraints, um, and at the same time that we've been able to expand the role of SPI to provide that same set of services to a lot of other really worthwhile projects. And anyway, you know. So I guess um, kind of two things that I was just going to say um, I thought of is that I mean, I have to agree. I think you guys have been doing a great job lately. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I've actually followed the mailing list. I do pay attention to, to the SBI traffic, in part because I'm also um, involved a great deal with Postgres. Um, and I was really happy to see that project um, start working with you guys. And I know Josh Drake's now 
um, a member on the board, and I, I think that's all, that's all great. I guess the only thing I was wondering is, um, I know there was a point at which, um, and I don't know if this was really in confidence or whatnot, but it was expressed to me some concern about using SPI for, for Postgres um, and for that project. Um, I don't know if you guys know anything, I mean, is everything going kind of well in that? Oh, yeah, okay. I, I think things are actually going really well. There was a point in time where we had some turnover in the membership of the board, and for some folks that was an enabler where all of a sudden they said, okay, well, you know, people we didn't necessarily want to deal with aren't there anymore. In other cases, it's like, oh, well, the people we like to deal with aren't there anymore. So there were a few sort of transitional things over who the people were on the SPI board. That was a few years ago, and since then things have, in that regard, been very calm, I think, because it's all maybe we've had fewer strong personalities duking it out with each other in board meetings. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. But um, the sense I have today is that the only sort of lingering problem, if you want to call it that, is that such a high percentage of the people on the board would list Debian as their primary project affiliation. Uh, you know, on some level, I would love to see people running for the board, uh, you know, to get board seats rep who, who would list some other project as their primary affiliation. Having Josh on there from the PostgreSQL community is wonderful, but you know, it'd be great to see folks from other places. On the other hand, you know, I was talking to Keith about the Keith Packard about this before the uh, uh, last election, sort of pointing out that, you know, by the way, poke poke, this is the time of year where if you wanted to bring somebody forward from the free desktop world or something and his reply was, well, why would I? You guys are doing fine. And so th there's this sort of funny trade-off. If you look at it, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of Debian folks on the board and, and doing things for SPI. You know, we originally created the corporation because Debian had a need. And so I'm not too bothered by that correlation. It's, we're not there because we're trying to push a Debian agenda. It's just, you know, this is a, a set of services the project needs and we're happy to provide those to other people too. But um, I know that sometimes people who don't know us very well look in from the outside and go, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of Debian guys. I also want to, uh, to use a VDL term, amplify a couple of the things VDL has said in his answers. Um, you know, I, I don't think there was anything quite like SPI back when we started in 1997. Um, and uh, now, as he's mentioned, there is the Software Freedom Conservancy, Association Software Libre, um, FFIS, and I, uh, I mean, there are some other organizations as well that serve one project, like Python Software Foundation, Free Software, Fo uh, uh, Free BSD Foundation. That's all great as well. But GNOME, GNOME Foundation, good, good example, which used to, they they started their own foundation after formally uh, being SPI affiliated. Um, I, I just think it's a, uh, you know, an, another form of SPI going broad and serving uh, many different needs is people adopting aspects of SPI's model that they like for their own organizations in other countries or in the US when they want to do things a little differently, and I think that's great. Similar to how organizations in the cooperative movement are not competitors with other cooperatives, I think it's great that um, we've sort of helped cooperate into a whole uh, system of umbrella organizations, which was an, a great innovation back in the 90s and still is. Uh, my name is Jack Farraher. The question is, as a 503C, are you allowed to lobby political organizations and institutions, and do you? Uh, no, we do not, and we're not legally allowed to do so. There are certain exceptions where you can make limited lobbying, but it's best not to perform any lobbying at all so you don't uh, get in trouble with the IRS. If we wanted to do any more political activities um, or lobbying or legislative, um, that would be best done with the creation of an additional legal entity or more than one. And if we wanted to do that, it would take sufficient interest and manpower. The, the only other thing I'd add to that is people have asked us at various times, well, what else can we do? What else would SPI like to do? And 
my answer has always been that if SPI contributing members have things that they would like to do in the name of the corporation, they should come and have a conversation with the board about it. And if it falls within our charter and the boundaries of our legal permissions, that we're very likely to support that activity. Um, the flip side of it is that my focus and that of, I think, most of the current board members has been on getting the small set of things that we've absolutely committed to our associated projects we would handle on their behalf so they didn't have to think about it, didn't have to worry about it, and you know, that would be our problem, not theirs, and get those right. And you know, if we run the clock back to that period I was talking about earlier, um, you know, we, we, we sort of needed to build some period of time during which we did get all of that right so everyone trusted that we knew how to do those things and so forth. I'm very pleased that that's all sort of history now and everything's good and everybody seems to be quite satisfied with the services we're providing. But when given the choice, I'd rather you know stay focused on a small set of core services and get those absolutely perfectly right than to you know add more activities that may very well have some other possible home that would be just as reasonable place for them to happen. But you know, um, this is a <coughs> you know, this is a uh, another one of those. Uh, none of us are paid to do any of the things that we do. So if other volunteers who are part of our contributing member base would like to, you know, propose other activities that they would like to do on behalf of and in the name of SPI, the board is always willing to hear proposals like that. Um, I I have usually quite some concerns with. Uh, people uh, willing to take over uh, open source projects usually, and SPI is probably a good target for them. Um, what kind of protection does SPI has it in, in constitution or other parts to protect from being taken over? And has there been some sort of maybe duplicating so the uh, organization in smaller? So I actually, um, the, the, the whole notion of sort of being subverted or, or taken over by bad actors, you know, who don't have our best interest at heart is something people talk about a lot. I personally think it's an overstated risk in a lot of places. And watching certain other organizations that I've tried to provide some advice and guidance to navigate this whole space, I've been disappointed at how timid people are sometimes. But in the SPI case, I think that our current structure has two very significant protections against that kind of activity. One is that in order to have a vote in the election process, you have to be a contributing member. Our membership committee is reasonably generous with granting contributing membership, but um, there is you know, a real litmus test there around the notion of are you an active participant in the free software process? Are you making contributions to some project? Are you a member of one of our associated projects? That sort of thing. So there would be no straightforward, easy mechanism for you know, a bunch of barbarians that show up at the gate and magically have voting privileges in an election. And the second piece is that um, under our current bylaws and current set of behavioral processes, we don't reelect all of the board every year. It's staggered over a three-year um, term. And so as a consequence, you know, it was, it was a strange situation this year that we actually had five board seats open. That would not normally be the case. Um, and it just has to do with links of service and when people filled gaps and all of this sort of thing. But um, there's been a lot of debate about the merits of having this kind of a rolling board versus you know, just reelecting everybody every year. And I'm not of hugely strong opinion on this, but many other successful 501c3s that I've been a part of or have observed in the past have used this sort of rolling board thing. It has the potential both to provide some continuity across you know, an annual election process, um, but also I think it does provide some protection against you know, being surprisingly or unexpectedly gamed. I m feel free to add this if it's not what I'm going to say, but um, given that we are a 501c3, um, we can't uh, be taken over into a uh, for-profit entity. All of uh, SPI's assets are permanently uh, dedicated to uh, char charitable, non-profit, uh, public purposes. Um, we could transfer assets as a project's request to, say, the Software Freedom Conservancy or uh, F probably FFIS or other groups, but we can't transfer them to, say, Microsoft for their general use, even if Microsoft wanted us to and paid us a lot of money. Perfectly said. <laughs> I'm Karen Sandler. I'm with the Software Freedom Law Center. So as a lawyer sitting here, I just wanted to say, ooh, there's one more. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, that was, that's exactly right. And then also, 
beyond just transferring assets if software in the public interest were to conduct its activities in a way that didn't support free and open source software as per its nonprofit mission, the IRS, when it looked at the annual reports, would probably have a big problem with it. So the, just the 501c3 status is some assurance about it being gamed. So. No, thanks. That's great. And, you know, this is part of what I was saying earlier, that the process of acquiring that status is non-trivial. Once you've got it, you do want to protect it. And so, you know, one of the, the responsibilities that we have as board members is to make sure that all of our activities remain in compliance with relevant laws. It's one of the reasons we've been so pleased to see uh, certain projects, Debian included, um, taking advantage of similar services being offered by other organizations in other geographies and other legal systems around the world is that's another interesting sort of protection in this particular case. You know, not all of Debian's assets are in SPI's hands. Some of them are with FFIS, some of them are in Brazil. So I don't I've There's actually a report that was on one of the lists recently from Debian, the, the Debian auditor, I guess, is the title of that role now. Um, and it was really quite interesting to me. I had not been paying enough attention to realize that as significant a percentage of Debian's assets are sprinkled around in various places as they are, and I think that's very healthy for the project. So it also means when we're trying to do things like reimburse expenses for people in um, Europe or in South America or something, we aren't constantly being burned by international money transfer fees, which you know we all know how to deal with it, but it's not cheap. Uh, what what um, do contributing members do? What's the range of volunteers you're looking for? And yeah, um, we would really, really like to throw out our current website infrastructure and replace it all. Um, if I end up doing it, it'll end up being you know icky wicky and git. But um, <laughs> yeah. We, we have this, this sort of problem, it's the classic problem every volunteer organization has. Somebody has a great idea, they implement a bunch of infrastructure, um, it works fine as long as they're there to massage it and care for it, and when they're gone, other people look around and go, what is this and how does it work? Um, and so, you know, it's not a big deal, but we, we, we sort of would love to fix that at some point. That's probably the biggest thing that we as a board care about right now. Um, you know, there are various tasks that come up from time to time. We've, t we've, we've uh, committed to scrubbing the contributing membership list, um, I guess, around the time of annual elections to make sure that we aren't accumulating no longer active participants and messing with quorum numbers over time and that sort of thing. Um, and I suspect that some, you know, if someone were interested in helping massage the database, that that's something that could happen at some point. Um, but no, on a day-to-day -day basis, there are not a whole lot of tasks that are just sitting around lacking attention. I would encourage people when the board elections come around next year, if this is something you're at all interested in or have friends that you'd like to you know, poke with sharp sticks to have them stand, I would much rather have more candidates than seats than the other way around. So um, I guess two questions just popped in my head from that is, which database are you using? <laughs> oh, okay. It's Postgres back. That's, uh, their website's currently clone running on top of Postgres. Okay, and then the other question I was wondering about is how are you going to, how, how is the scrubbing of the membership list going to work? I'm just curious about the, are you going to like notify people we're going to take you off or? Uh, okay. So uh, I'm also on the SBI membership committee. Uh, in our current bylaws, we have uh, the means to basically expire people. Uh, several years ago, there was actually an automated process to uh, you basically set the expiration date and then some system would automatically email someone saying, hey, do you still want to be a contributing member? Unfortunately, we don't seem to know how to make that work anymore. <laughs> so in addition to the main website, we also need assistance in updating the uh, membership website because uh, we have quite a few issues with that not functioning the way that we would want it to for proper 100% functionality. Um, so, in the current uh, board resolution that was made uh, some months ago, um, we agreed that after the uh, board election, we'd send people who didn't vote. Now, in this case, um, there, no one voted, but um, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll send <laughs> we'll, we'll send people uh, who are contributing members of status ping saying, "Hey, are you still involved in the community? Do you still want to be a contributing member?" And if they respond, great they'll stay. Um, if they don't, then they'll be 
reversibly, not permanently downgraded to non-contributing. And if they want to be re-upgraded and still meet the criteria, which any member of a Debian, uh, of a associated project like Debian or Postgres automatically does, um, then they can certainly regain contributing status. This will mainly just, uh, the, the, the motivation f for this is partly just to uh, ensure the contributing membership means something, but also BDL alluded to quorum requirements. Um, there are some uh, major improvements that we could make in our bylaws, but we have to uh, get a certain percentage of our contributing members, so quorum requirements do actually matter. Yeah, I forgot. I've been saying for years that it would be wonderful if someone would just like sit down and fix our bylaws. And I, you know, we have conflicting opinions about the right fixes. We have no conflict at all about the fact that what we currently have is self-contradictory and impedes progress. Um, the, the, the language in the bylaws around when we are supposed to hold meetings and what we have to do to hold a meeting, for example, is does, did not comprehend you know, monthly board meetings on IRC. And so uh, you know, nobody's likely to call us on it, but you know, our bylaws have a set of requirements which we do our best to meet in the context of you know, wanting to operate in a more responsive and more modern way. So um, kind of I guess regarding that, um, do we have um, like reporting obligations to the IRS or other folks? About yes, and we actually do uh, file IRS uh, reports every year. You can check uh, websites like guidestar.org. You can see our 990s. Okay, so but we don't have to. I mean, so we, principally we have to report to the IRS, so we don't have to report to the Federal Trade folks or anything like that. Okay, nothing with the Federal Trade. Commission or FCC or anything like that. Um, we also actually do more reporting than we have to. For example, um, in our meeting agendas uh, and I think our meeting minutes as well, um, and also on the contributing member SPI private mailing list, um, the first two locations are, that I mentioned are public. Uh, we give uh, monthly treasurer reports similar to uh, what uh, Michael showed plus income and expenses. Um, and, uh, we're generally a lot more open than we're required to be, so there's a lot of ways to see what we do. That's also led to the interesting situation that the last three or four years, we've briefly had a conversation about, do we need to generate an annual report to our contributing members? And we always sort of lean back and go, but what would we report on that isn't already where they can click and get it? And the, the reality is it would probably be a nice thing for us to do to create some kind of a, you know, at least a, a token object that had links to the the right places or something, but um, it, it is quite interesting that unlike some other um, 501c3s serving the free software world, we do have all of our board meetings on a completely open channel and things like this. So there's just there's very little at any given moment that you know our contributing members don't already have access to that would you know lend meaning to the process of generating something like an annual report to members. So. If somebody really wants to draft an annual report for us, we you know, volunteer is always welcome. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Uh, now you know what we look like. We'll be around uh, for the rest of the week. If you have questions or thoughts or, or ideas for us, feel free to let us know. Please tell your, contribu please tell your projects about us. Have them get more involved. Pay attention to us.